I started out with red lasers. I've come up with so many great laser tricks and I like to you know, be able to do it in ways that you don't get caught. Very quick flash. What the heck was that? The cherry on my Sunday lit up red and then it went out. What was that? <laughs> and one of the cute ones I came up with once was in Cancun. I was at the Hard Rock Cafe and I, I, I was used to like shining my laser on. After a while, you show them to the waiter. You say, look at this. And they say, wow, that's interesting. They don't know what the lights are. Because in the early days, they didn't know lasers. When you see a dot, look for a laser. And I'd show it to them. Well, this one guy came over to the table. I said, watch this. And I had a second laser in my other hand. He didn't know it. I shined the laser in my head and I wiggled my head up and down and there's this dot on the wall going up and down. And, and, and he thought it was going through. He said, wow, will that work on me? I said, yeah. He says, can I go show my friends? Yeah, so I gave him the laser. He goes over to this other table, he puts it up to his ear and I shine my other laser on the wall. <laughs> Which, if, he, if it was really going through your head, it was a pretty dumb thing to do. <laughs> and then in later years, in later years, I came up with a trick of shining a one color laser in my ear and a different one came out on the wall. And I would tell people that DNA is a stereoscopic isomer that polarizes light and changes the color. <laughs> <laughs> earliest memories um yeah. you go back anyone might you go back and it's all you had was board games and card games yeah. and you know of course games like let's go out and play cowboys and indians you know and dodgeball at school the standard little simple games it's really interesting because over time i watch that kids grow up and when they're very young in elementary school they all get into it they learn a bunch of card games that they're taught and the card games are always changing they're always different you always have to learn new rules it's like our generation is different than the generation that was one year before us and different than the generation one year after us. So the games all have to change. Um, and so, I, yeah, I, and I played a lot of um, games some summers. I would just sit there constantly playing all the games of solitaire that I could and uh, loved playing games. I had a very happy life, a very joking life. And I came to a philosophy later in life that your life is all about happiness. That's how you judge it. It's not how successful you are and how many yachts you own and that kind of stuff. It's how much you smiled. And so entertainment is very, very important in, in my, my way of thinking and uh, just you know, finding ways to enjoy life. Also, when you work so hard, I grew up, you know, oh my God, working so late at night trying to solve problems and think of ways to connect circuits together and get something working. Man, you gotta, you gotta take breaks. Yeah. You have to include work with, fun with your work. It was a philosophy of my life. So a lot of breaks to play games. Even today, I do email. I just get so tired of hours of email. I've just got to break and play a few card games online or play my Tetris on the Game Boy. So, so yeah, so I, I grew up with, um, you know, a, a lot of people. It was probably an, a normal amount of gaming, but some people maybe grew up and don't consider games worthwhile at all. They had a couple of PhD parents, and all they do is, you know, read and study, and <laughs> that, that's what life's about. No, I wasn't... The, but most people play games. Yeah. It's really interesting because things that you do for your, your own entertainment at home. I believe very much in the common Joe, in the common home. Make our home life fun and pleasurable. Today it is. Back then, I thought, whoa, we're so lucky to have washing machines. Our great-grandparents had to wash clothes by hand. What a horrible life they had. We engineers have to create newer, better things. And I, the, the greatest little toy of my life was a transistor radio with six transistors, and I could listen to music all night long while I slept. And then they made chips. My dad, when I was eight years old, took me to an electronics show, and a guy, it might have been Gordon Moore, you know, the inventor of chips, showed me a diagram. He said, this is gonna be a chip with six transistors on one piece of silicon. And I went home and I told my dad, oh, now we're gonna have better transistor radios. You know, that was the closest thing to a game. And he says, no, 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 no. Nobody can afford new technologies in, in their homes, only the military. Only the military can buy the chips because they need to save every fraction of a gram on rockets that go up in, in space and, and get launched from submarines and that kind of stuff. It was the space race days. And I said, darn, you know, because I wanted, and he said that after a few years, surplus, extra junk falls out and that's what people get. And I was so, I was so pissed inside. I didn't say it to him, but darn it. I wanted the needs of the average person to be more important than those of the big businesses, the government, the military. And sure enough, look where we've gotten to. The fastest chips made, the biggest chips on earth are really are put in games. And then the military takes advantage of the, uh, the, the um, economies of volume, economies of scale. The first computer games I saw, we're, we're back in dark ages. We didn't have computers in our school. Um, I had to go to a company to sort of learn how to program. And you saw some very simple games. And these were 
early, even earlier than, than the ARPANET or the very starting days of the ARPANET where universities could connect together. And you could type in a few text commands and it would tell you hints about where um, a submarine was or the Star Trek uh, uh, ship or, um, or I mean, the Klingons where they were or the Wumpus. And you would kind of make guesses to move left or right and you'd work yourself through a game. This was fascinating. Every time a company that owned computers had an open house, they let the, the families come in and play. They set up computers playing games. That meant that if a computer, to me, it told me if a computer can play a game, it can do all the serious work that computers do as well. And um, I had a friend that worked at Stanford Artificial Intelligence Center. So I'd ride my bike over there and it was just open. You know, it's open, when smart people are always open thinkers, they don't lock doors, it's not closed at all, walk right in. They had the big tube and it was playing the early game of Space War that was developed for the PDP-1 computer. It was running on a PDP-11 there. And wow, you had the spaceship going around being pulled by gravity into the center. So that was sort of an idea of what could come in arcade games, but it was like hugely expensive. No person could ever afford it. Never ever thought about developing games. Um, I knew that I was a really incredible digital designer, but I didn't think digital design was about games. I thought it was about computers and that sort of, and logic games. Oh, I'm sorry, in sixth grade, I built a machine with a um, hundred little rules and every rule was a logic gate that I bet I pounded nails into wood and I connected transistors and resistors and diodes and power supplies. And I built a hundred little rules that played tic-tac-toe, a game without losing. So that was very computerish, but I moved up to adders and subtractors by eighth grade and, and, um, and yeah, and I love the idea that you could make games. I always knew that computers could make games and play games. And I was interested in that, but I didn't know exactly. Oh yeah, I knew how to program. You know what? I knew that I could program a game. Maybe some of the ones I'd seen were a little beyond my level, but who knows. Uh, but then I saw a real arcade game, and that was Pong. And I was stunned, because before that, all you had was arcade machines, which were physical atoms, balls rolling around and being hit by flippers. Now you had a little dot on a screen, they were charging 25 cents to play it. The line was so long to get on this machine, and that was back when the, the, the pinball games were 10 cents. The Pong, I said, my God, you, a television set solves the problem of the cost of input-output. The, the movement towards the games we have today was largely one of how do you do it at a reasonable cost that people can afford. That was a big challenge, you know. You had to put a, we had to put a lot of work, a lot of engineering, a lot of thinking into it. But I just dined up, I said, oh my gosh, I know how TVs work. I know all their signals for drawing lines and drawing frames and putting dots on the screen. So I built a little device, 28 little $1 chips, and I built my own Pong. But it was hardware. See, nowadays you would just write a game of Pong in software and, oh my gosh, if you kind of know what you're doing, it might even take you a day or two days, you know, or it's a beginning programming class. Back then it was hardware. That was a different world. I was good at hardware and software. So Pong was the start and then Steve Jobs actually took my Pong game down to Atari. And he didn't have anything to do with the design of it, but I think they thought he did. And they hired him. They hired him, but he couldn't ever really do the engineering design. He could do a little. I'm sorry, he could do a little. He could like modify a few pieces or put a sound chip in to make sounds for a game. And um, and he worked on the night shift all alone, so I could go down and visit and see the new Atari games. I got to play like Grand Track 10, the first car game. Before it was out there, I got so good at it. Eventually, in my town of Scotts Valley, they had a pizza parlor. Free pizza, free small pizza. If you could get 36 points or more on um, on um, Grand Track 10, I could easily do that. So after I won two free pizzas, they took it out. <laughs> but so I loved playing the games as well as as designing them. And I designed Breakout for Atari. And so, it was all hardware, yeah. Steve Jobs got that order from the, the owner of Atari. I designed the whole thing and it was really an incredible project because I designed things with very few parts. It's the way my thinking is. You've got to understand it so well you can simplify it and figure out ways to use parts in more than one way and, and all that. And Atari was getting tired of their engineers designing games with 150 chips, 160 chips, and 190 chips. And I just did the, I did all a breakout in 45 chips. Well, well, Steve Jobs came to me and he said that Atari wanted me to design this and I had only four days to do it. Well, no, back then, hardware games, I'm sorry, it's not like software. This was a half a man year project. And I was like one of the greatest designers ever. I was working on the iPhone 5 of its day, the hottest gadget product in the world. It was the Hewlett Packard Scientific Calculator. 
They had hired me even though I didn't have a college degree. And I thought I was the greatest designer, but four days, I didn't think I could do it. Went four days with no sleep. Um, Steve and I both got mononucleosis, the sleeping sickness, and we delivered a working breakout game. And that was, you know, obviously a big classic. Um, supposedly the Atari engineers couldn't understand my design. It was just so beautiful and advanced, but they couldn't get to it. I never got to talk to them. I, I don't know if they knew that I did it. They paid Steve Jobs, and then he paid me half the money, supposedly. Yeah, wasn't there some debate about that? Do you have any thoughts on that? The, yeah, there's some debate. My thoughts about it are, Steve should have been more open and honest with me. He should have told me, yeah, I'm really getting thousands for this, but I'll pay you this much. You know, or, I, or he should have said, I need the money to buy into a farm in Oregon. And I would say, take it all. I don't need an income. I've got a job as an engineer. I don't need the money. I didn't need the money. <laughs> you know, I would have done that for him. So it's a tiny thing. It's only one thing in life. But he did tell me that we would get paid 700 bucks. Then he wrote me a check for 350 and he got paid thousands. Yeah. So whatever. You know, you know, it, it could be a distorted story over time. Maybe he was paid thousands for the whole project and the last, you know, but he should have told me differently because um, so, uh, we were such close friends. Yeah, yeah. So what was the word? But the, the fun of doing it, the fun of doing it overrides any, anything like that. Who yeah. cares about money? Yeah. You know, you, well, you do care about friendship and honesty. Steve Jobs said that it was Nolan Bushnell's idea. He wanted a one-player pawn game. He, and Steve described how it had to have bricks and all. Now, it could be that Steve had actually thought up the design game and sold it to Nolan Bushnell. because, And he was very specific. The score had to be at the bottom. I said, I could maybe save a half a chip if I move the score to the top. No, no, it has to be at the bottom or wherever it was. Okay. Uh, so I didn't have that much leeway. Um, I, I did choose the number of bricks. I don't think that was a, a big issue, but well, I had a 256 bit RAM, so you might as well, so it's gonna be 128 bricks or it's gonna be 256 bricks. And um, that was a, it was a real fun project, but since I've already done Pong, so it's really just an extension of a game where you've already programmed a game that has paddles and balls that can move at different angles and speeds. Mm -hmm. It's just putting in the reflection and counting when you hit bricks. Um, there was no name when I did the project at all, no name assigned. So when Atari came out with it, they chose a name. And Steve Jobs was no longer at Atari. Right after we finished the game, he went up to Oregon, bought into that orchard or whatever it was, and, and um, so Atari came up with the name on their own. Cool. I was so tired, in and out of sleep, but you know what, that makes your mind creative. And I was out on the factory floor, and they had one huge game that four players would play with their own little cars, you know, each one had their own cars, a bigger game. And, I, and there was this idea that they were going to use microprocessors, but they weren't using them in games yet. Games were not yet software. And that triggered my mind. Microprocessors can actually program games. Interesting. I'm going to have to think about that. I didn't see the formula right away, because microprocessors were brand new and they were very weak. So you wouldn't necessarily think of them like you do today. Another, another example though, there was a TV set on the factory floor. They only used black and white TVs for their games. And this TV set wasn't playing a game, but it had a dot going from left to right and right to left. And as it moved, it was changing colors, red, blue, green, yellow. I, I surmised there must be mylar or something. I couldn't see it. And I just went back to, I went back to my lab bench over here. Steve was working over there breadboarding my design. He would be hooking the wires together. And when, whenever it got to a certain point, I'd go over and test it because I understood the circuit. And so I'm just sitting there thinking, color. It was like hypnotizing, like, like a psychotic light show or something at a concert. I'm thinking back to television. I understood it very well from high school electronics. I had a ham radio operator license when I was, in, when I was 10 years old. So analog electronics was also in my background. I thought, oh my gosh, how colors uh, get interpreted by a television and an idea popped in my head. Up until then, color on a television was generated with perfect sine waves that represented red, green, blue, and the way and the circuits that mixed them and put their amplitudes at certain things for brightness was such, it was came from all the calculus formulas that you use when you analyze a circuit you're designing. Hardware circuits with feedback and resistors and capacitors and, and inductors and, and that was a thousand dollar board to generate color in those days. Very complicated analog stuff. And here popped in my idea of a little way to put out a digital signal with ones and zeros. Four ones and zeros. If you repeat them, it popped in my head. If I repeat them, one, one, zero, zero, it goes up, and it goes down. If you think of it, one's up, up, and zeros is down. Ones are up, zeros are down. Up and down, up and down. And it's not like a sine wave like red, but I knew how televisions work. 
they're going to interpret the up going and they're going to call this signal red. And if I put the ones and zeros in a slightly different point in time, they're going to call it blue. Oh my God, I have 16 different colors. Some that are brighter, some that are darker. Would it work? There's never been a book that ever talked about creating color digitally. It wasn't allowed. It wasn't, it wasn't done. But I always just, I designed every single thing in the Apple II. It was just so original. Never ever like ever before designed. But it made it possible. A one little $1 chip could generate color instead of a $1,000 color generation board. And when I went to design the Apple II computer, I started out thinking the frequencies of crystals that you have to have for U.S. color television. And those frequencies, how do they divide up to the, the rate at which microprocessors go? And you want to have even divide downs. And I divided by the, my starting frequency by, by it was f um, four times color TV frequency. Divided it two, got about seven megahertz. Divided that by seven, got one megahertz to drive the processor. The RAMs by then were up to two megahertz. So I only divided it by um, uh, half of that, and I had the RAMs going twice as fast. And then every bit, of, as you went across the screen, I could put little ones and zeros would make color. If you had one, zero, one, zero, it would be red. You know, something like one, one, zero, zero, one, one. Those little patterns I was talking about would turn out to be different colors. And I just put them in the bytes, and it was a little tricky because I only had, the way the timing worked out, I only had seven dots per byte. A byte is eight bits seven dots on the screen, so that means that the even bytes and the odd bytes had to be off, off by a bit. They had to be shifted from each other to keep the color consistent. It was, so it was a lot of trickiness and software, but everything had to work out to that one crystal frequency starting out with color. Would it work? I built the whole thing up. I designed it just totally from scratch. A clever little circuits with almost no parts at all to generate the color timing, the counters for horizontal and vertical on a television to decide when to send signals telling the TV when to do another line and put in color sync signals so it knows what, what red is, where red starts in time, every line. And then, I, um, and then I tested it out and I type in a number and a blue spot pops up on my TV. And I typed in another number and a green spot popped up somewhere else. Right out of the computer memory to the, to the display was another trick I thought of that had never been done. Up until then, computers talked to video displays over a serial cable. And they could send an A and send a B and send a C to the, you know, but it was, uh, you had to have the whole serial device save its entire screen. I just put it in the computer memory. So that was, so that made all this, all of a sudden, when Steve Jobs came over, and we, I could type a number and you'd see a green dot on the TV, instantly you know you can program games, you can program any animation. All this Atari stuff could now be in color. You could just simply write programs to move numbers around in memory and you would have games. I had a high res in the Apple II, so which in the, you could actually even, by using masks, in, change individual bits and pixels and have very high, just like pixels, very high resolution shapes as well. This stuff had never ever been thought of for you know a home computer that was affordable. But I, I just determined that my computer had to be a game machine. When I, I wrote a basic for it, because a computer is nothing without a programming language. If you have a bunch of switches and lights and you can push a button and some ones and zeros go into memory, that's geeky computer stuff. That's not usable. I wanted the typewriter keyboard, and I'd already built a terminal that talked to faraway computers anyway. And I, I want to type on a keyboard and I want to see things on my video display. And I wanted to run programs, but I needed to program them in BASIC because kids had to buy these machines. It wasn't going to be changing the world unless it had, had a language. So I wrote a BASIC and I called my BASIC Game BASIC. You could go back on every note I ever wrote. I called it Game BASIC. And my whole idea was if you write a language that can play games, it can do all the things that computers do that I don't know about financial stuff. I don't know what companies use computers for. I only know what I like to use them for. And it's games and also I like to write programs to solve my simulations at, a, at Hewlett Packard for my own designs. So it has to do work and it has to play games. Now games, it's really interesting. Both those subjects were for me. They weren't for a product for the world. And therefore, when I wrote my basic, I decided I would save one month and I left out floating point numbers numbers with decimal points because games boil down to logic and that's digital integer numbers and my simulations at, on of logic were dig, were done better by integers and even our calculators at Hewlett Packard that calculated sines and cosines did those calculations with integers because it was more accurate and and also faster some clever algorithms mm -hmm. so i left out floating point and i took a lot of heat for that in later years and we had to we had to have microsoft rewrote a basic their way with floating point numbers and we licensed it and 
Uh, but I had a beautiful basic because I'd never, never taken a course in writing a language, but I really taught myself how to do it. Awesome. But, but, and games were the intent. And one of the first things I did was, okay, I knew that I had a machine with a microprocessor that could do a million things a second. Move those bits around on the screen and make things move and play games and all. And I thought, I wonder with my slow basic, can I write a game in basic that's playable? Breakout, I'd done Breakout for Atari, I knew Breakout. Would it be fast enough or would it be too slow? Because basic's a slow interpreted language. And I wrote a little, little program and flooded a bunch of bricks in color. And I changed the color of them. And I changed the color and I changed the color 20 times to what I liked. And then I, I programmed in a little paddle that would move up and down as you turn the knob. I built, I built paddles and paddle hardware into the Apple II deliberately for the game of Breakout. I wanted everything in there. I put in a speaker with sound so I could have beeps like games need. So a lot of the Apple II was designed be, to be a game machine as well as a computer because I thought that is the way to get it to people, to get people to start buying these machines. And I programmed BASIC up in half an hour. I had tried 100 variations that would have taken me 10 years in hardware if I could have even done it. So I called Steve Jobs over to my apartment and we sat down on the floor next to the cable snaking into my TV that had the back off of it so I could get wires inside. And, and, and I showed him how I could change the colors of things and change the shape of the paddle and change the speed of the ball so easy in a basic command. And he and I looked at each other and we were both kind of shaking because we knew that the world of games was never going to be the same now that they were software. I mean, that was up till then. There weren't software games in the arcades, you know. Uh, so, but you know, now that animated games were going to be software, oh my God, and that a fifth grader could program in basic and make games like Breakout. This was going to be a new world. We saw it right then. I saw I saw some other people in Apple in later times. You know, we were trying to move individual little bits and in, change bits in bikes and have have it change on the screen and try to make it look natural and smooth and human. That depends on the speed of your processor. Our processor was a little 8-bit processor running at 1 megahertz. Very slow for that. But when I watched Bill Budge build a color color looking pinball game with flippers that actually flipped while the ball was moving, got so many things going at every place possible. He just worked so hard in assembly language, machine language, to program every bit as fast as was ever possible. And that was just amazing to see that a game could finally be done that was that good of quality. And I, I also got to see um, Bob Bishop was a guy who wrote a little starting game, landing, uh, landing a rocket on the moon. And you had to adjust things just right to get it down without crashing. We lost so many days of work at Apple, and, and I, I met Bob at a show, and I said, you got to come to work. You should come to work for us, you know. We'll give you stock, you know. It'll be worth a lot in the life that you like to leave, the independent life. And he left Caltech and came and, and he left JPL and came and joined Apple, and he was one of the early ones who was writing this astounding stuff, you know, yeah. like, like programs that could speak to you, and you could speak into a microphone, and they could kind of understand you a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You want to talk about uh, Steve Jobs's theories on games. I know he wasn't a big fan overall. Do you have any insight into why that would be? The funny thing is, um, he, I think he actually loved his time at Atari, but I don't think, I think he found that he was not a designer. He was not an engineer. That might be part of it, because he's always tried to separate himself from the technical people. He's not technical, and he doesn't want anything technical to show in computers. And I agree with that philosophy. The masses of people are not computer geeks, and they shouldn't be told how many bytes something is, what model processor it is. That is stuff that gets in the way of doing what you really want to do. And so I, so I admire Steve for that. He thought like the rest of us have to. It's hard to be both. But I really think it started out with him not being technical. And as far as games go, the software developers that were developing games, we had this guy, Dana Reddington. He was a, um, a actually a doctor, a trained doctor, and he had a PhD. And, and he's working with the medical center at Stanford, and he worked at Apple. And he did the first high-res game with some little spaceships going by, and you'd point your gun at them and shoot them down. You know, it was a real animated, a real game that could have been, you know, uh, I mean, it was new. It wasn't a copy of something out on the market, and it was just cute. We called it Star Wars at first, but we had to change the name <laughs> eventually. I mean, we didn't pay attention to, what are copyrights? We're too young to know about these things. Um, he did this great game, and Steve thought it was really lousy. I had watched how he had figured out schemes of exclusive warring bits and getting bits to change just at the ultimate speed of that processor to make it seem realistic. So I admired his work so much, and yet he just kind of got dismissed by Steve. Now in later times, I think, I don't know why, but Steve didn't seem to have that light sense of humor that you should have joking along with everything else. He became, I think, very serious business-like because his goal was to run a company. 
and his, and he wanted to look professional in the professional business magazines and didn't want to talk about blue boxes and free calls back in college anymore. And eventually when he came back to Apple, Easter eggs were disallowed. Easter eggs, these fun little things that programmers put in that if you know the special code, you pop up a picture or a little game, you know, maybe a game of breakout, maybe other games. So much fun, not allowed in Apple at all. You get fired if you try something like that now. And awesome. I don't know why. And um, and this, this whole gaming world is, you know, just, yeah, I don't know why. It was not a part of him. He, he didn't really have that much of like the sense of humor of joking and pranking. But one time, I, I remember one time, 12 years after I'd done a prank, I, sh I sh gave it to him as a, in a framed copy for his birthday. He didn't know I'd done it. It was when we introduced the Apple II computer, too. I gave it to him. He saw it. He broke out in laughter. He didn't know I'd done it. <laughs> so, so, you know, and God, when I knew him in high school, yeah, he was just as fun as anyone else, but he was really looking for serious ways of the world, too. I know, that, I know designers later on actually had arguments with him, like I'm thinking of uh, Ron Gilbert in particular, who's working at LucasArts, mm -hmm. about uh, the potential of storytelling in games. He never believed that video games could tell a story. Mm -hmm. it, it's just that philosophy of games are silly, it's time to get serious. Um, well, you know, I, I don't... I, I don't I don't get into that. I just I just I just enjoy games for enjoyment. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things you can enjoy in life, but life is about the first thing you need is the necessities of life, which is food. The second that's I so I call it one of the three F's, food. The second F is fun. Every kind of entertainment, including games, concerts, movies. They're just things that make you feel good and you know, and the other is friends, because you can joke with friends. That's also humor. So the three F's and when I told that story to our high school when they put me in the, the um um, the Hall of Fame at the high school, the kids started laughing. And I said, there might be a fourth F. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's really funny because games involve so much creativity. Somebody thought of some clever things that really give enjoyment to other people. So Steve should have appreciated the creative people that were doing games. Um, in those early days, I bought every single software product and hardware product that came out for the Apple II. And I went through a lot of the games. I just can't remember them very well. I remember Choplifter. I remember a first adventure game that took like 10, 10 floppy disks. Um, you know, it was, a, it, was, it was a huge game. And I loved working through it. It took me a long time. I remember when Ultima came out, but I didn't get very far into it. But I admired. I was actually, when I met the writer, he'd written it like when he was 17 years old or something, Richard Garriott. I met him at a, at a show in, in Chicago where Apple was. I was afraid to talk to this guy. I got introduced to him. I couldn't tell you, he was like a god to me because the story of how something in his life, Dungeons and Dragons that was in his head that his parents thought was really negative and bad and taking him out of the world, he had turned it into reality and turned it into a game that was actually popular and being sold. So I, I just admired him so much for that. You know, I didn't, I didn't pay an awful lot of attention to it. Um, schools were very important to me, but I didn't have time to go checking out curriculum. It was a lot of curriculum there. Yeah, but like it was very important. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, Oregon Trail. Yeah, I, I just what, didn't missed out on those games. It came at a point, just a time in my life when um, other things were going on. And we had Nintendo games at home. But my kids got better than me at Nintendo between fourth and fifth grade. I said, I'm not going to compete with these kids. They're too fast, and I'll never be that good again. <laughs> I'll stick with the simpler games. But um, things like Oregon Trail, the Sim Cities. yeah, I watched my own kids do them more than I did. The, I didn't have the time by then to do them myself, but... Um, those were incredible, uh, like you said, learning experiences, very educational. And look how many schools actually use them, too. When we started with the Apple II, we had cassette tapes. And all of a sudden you had, uh, and I thought that people were going to write their own programs, save it on cassette tape, and they're going to solve their own problems. They're going to become programmers like me. No, all of a sudden everybody started producing programs pre-written. VisiCalc, of course, was the killer app. And they just bought cassette tapes of game, 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 game. And then when floppies came out, they'd have a whole shoebox. You'd go to a club and every kid would have a shoebox full, mostly of games. They'd have the few serious programs, you know, like DB Master for databases and VisiCalc, of course. And, but they'd have all these games and show them off. And it, was, it became a big thing. You wanted to copy them more than you really would have bought them. You just, it was more collecting the whole thing rather than, you want, I wanted them to play and I'm going to try to steal them. But there was a lot of copying going on. You know, if you imagine a society without games, you probably have a pretty hard life. And you just are working two jobs or something and you just come home and you don't have you don't even have time to watch TV or something. I mean, what benefit does TV have? What benefits does music have in our life? To me, it's it's a real driving force and I feel very happy because of it. I, I think if you went all the way back in time to the cavemen, they had games they played. Little outdoor games, throwing balls around, whatever. Just humans want to make up games. It's part of the natural creativity, uh, creative element. It's based in us. 
with without them without them um boy i don't know i wouldn't want to be that person because i i like interesting things and i like creative things and i like challenges i love games where i now it used to be you had to play against a person now you can actually play against a computer. It might be the game of bridge, or it might be a simpler game, or it might be even playing Tetris to see how far you can get competing with yourself. But something is fighting you back. That's a that's a fun little challenge in life, and it pushes you pushes you up trying real hard. And then when it's over, a little release. And I I don't know. I think that's good for um, good for health. Uh, so the big rumor in the gaming industry right now is everyone's scared of Apple, especially if Apple moves into the living room and fully connects the, you know, Apple TV or whatever it may be mm -hmm. to the television set. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that potential future, or if you'd like to see it. Yeah, I don't watch the gaming industry like you guys do, and I was not really aware of that concern. Um, obviously, the, the iPhone kind of became the hot mobile machine of all time, you know, and it's and the iPad, and everywhere you go, you see kids playing those machines now rather than, you know, the, the Game Boy Advance or whatever, whatever, whatever was, were the ones before PS3. Uh, whatever, whatever the other games were, yeah. So um, I don't know what the effect is. It's brought more games into our life. It's also given young people who want to write games. A lot of people start out, and when you're young, you don't need a huge income. You're not after big money, success. You just want to do what you feel you're good at, and you want to write a game and get it out to people. If it's for free, fine. If it's for one dollar, you might even make a little money. But the whole point isn't I'm going to become rich from doing this. But young people have a way to get their games written and put onto a product and sold in the Apple Store. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy for Apple making that possible. If Apple moves into the, into the the tel the living room, I don't know. Does that mean that games like PS3 go away or um, of. or Nintendo's uh, the Wii goes away? Uh, yeah, Xbox. Uh, I, I, no, I think Apple would just be another player, and they've got to prove themselves good at games first. Apple is so is one thing really good that they do. They develop in secret. They can set up groups, develop an entire technology for years and years, and it doesn't ever come out. Or if it's so great, it's going to take over the world, not just sell, but be great. Then it comes out, and yeah, Apple might be a big player in games someday, because companies always want to grow. and. Right now, you're kind of limited with the sort of products we can define, you know, the phones, the tablets, and the computers, and where's the growth area? Of course, they're talking about a watch, wearable computing, we're talking about Apple TV, talking about cars. So, oh, could a game machine, you know, make a ton of sense? Well, I think Apple would say the iPad is our game machine. So our television might run all of the iOS software, and therefore, it would instantly, it would run tens of thousands of games. I think that would be more likely to expect from Apple. And I, I don't really have any inside oh, knowledge, but and I don't have any negative opinions about Apple's role because everything Apple does is good, and um, you still have a lot of choice. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine them building a television that you can't run your other devices into, mm -hmm. even if it's an old DVD player that nobody uses anymore, or a, or a computer, or AirPlay, or or your game machines, you know, your, your, your Xbox. I can't imagine Apple designing a TV that would only work with their stuff. And if they did, it would be way too much that Apple closeness that I hate. Yeah. A lot of people have spoken of games and what they say about them catch my attention. And I don't memorize them because I am so short of time these days, constantly just traveling, 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 doing email. And I just don't have time to take up new things that are going to be time consuming. Um, I am going to, I am going to actually though, I'm going to program some games of my own again. I'm going to go back 40 years in my life and I'm going to use the Raspberry Pi and I'm going to actually teach myself uh, Linux and programming on it. And that's my, I'm going to actually be building, if they aren't games, they'll be little robots at least. Okay. So yeah. So it'll be, so it'll be my, yeah, my own little, little dinky thing that has no value compared to today's modern, you know, games that have hundreds of developers working on them just for fun. And there's actually a game out right now that my wife and I did some voiceovers and it's called Waz with a Cause or Vengeance, uh, Danny Trejo. It's based on a movie that they had made with him and, and he's sort of against this game, but my wife and I recorded some lines. We did it voluntarily for free, just for a friend. And it's kind of a neat game, people say. I haven't had quite time to go through the whole thing yet, but... Do you ever give presentations at game companies? Do you get offers to go visit? Um, I don't remember ever doing it at game companies. I go to a lot of companies for presentations, but don't remember. Now, I was one of the founders and starters of Electronic Arts. Uh, Trip Hawkins, who started it, was a very good friend of mine at Apple. 
and he invited me in. I was on the first board, and that company was, that's unusual. I've been involved with so many startups, and so few of them actually make it. And electronic arts, that's huge to be still going here, you know, 30 years later. I did look around when I spotted at computer shows that I would go to, when I spotted somebody who had developed some really great thing, I'd get them in touch with electronic arts, and a couple of times it led to uh, products that they came out with. What was I didn't make, I was not a dealer maker, but I certainly found, um, uh, it was a fly, flight game, one of them. I just ran into this young kid who'd written it. He didn't have any deals with game companies, so it uh, fit right into Electronics Arts Pocket. And I also liked their way of thinking about games are going to be much huger than one person writing software, which is all it had been till then. Games are going to be like movies with crews of designers for different categories, things in the game. There's going to be producers that have the overall authority as, as to who's going to be doing what jobs. There's going to be programmers. There's going to be script, script writers, essentially, and uh, modeled it on the movie industry. I thought that was very intriguing. Yeah. And Electronic Arts made some bad mistakes, too. I was one of the supporters of buying this program that would kind of do everything for a secretary in a business, from contact lists to dialing. It's stuff that we live on today that is our life. The category was right, but the trouble is businesses that were going with one, two, three that did everything. And so it kind of like it had no way to really sell. It didn't, it didn't really um, sell into the buying market. Yeah. So yeah, they lost a lot on that. But I didn't get, I don't like to get involved in business and I don't, I'm non-conflict. So that's the reason I avoid business and running companies is I don't want to be involved in arguments yelling, telling somebody else they're wrong. I never ever want to be that way. And I've been very lucky in life. I've just avoided it. Could I ask you to play a game of Tetris for us and we can watch? <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, I will I will light up the screen. Can you tell us the story of how you got started with yes. Tetris and your involvement in it? The way I got started with the, with Tetris is I was I loved uh, you know Nintendo and games. And when the Game Boy came out in the United States, I bought a whole bunch of them for my kids and a bunch of their friends. I like to I like to treat their friends kind of like part of my family. And this was the new hot game and it came with Tetris. And I started trying to play, I couldn't understand it. So my young son taught me, oh, what a Tetris is, how you get lines. I didn't even know the rules of the game. Oh my gosh, I started playing it and got a little skill. Then I found out that a couple of my adult friends on a trip to Hawaii were playing it. And, I, and one of them taught me if you start at a higher level, you get more points. I didn't even know that. So I started a higher level. Wow, I was getting some good scores. And after a while, I was getting better scores than all my friends. And then I started sending my scores into Nintendo Power Magazine. In those days, you would take a photograph of the screen, real photograph, and send it in. We didn't have, um, we didn't have internet or something. And it wasn't, you know, so it wasn't, you couldn't send them an electronic file. I would send them into Nintendo Power Magazine, and I always had the high score in the country. And then one time, they, they didn't want to print my name anymore. I'd been in so often with my high scores at, at uh, Tetris that I actually spelled my name backwards, Evitz Kainzow, and forgot I'd done it. And the next month, I saw it in there and got scared that somebody else had a high score, too. And, and it's funny, but I actually now, I've gotten through a friend on eBay, I've actually gotten a copy of that magazine um, with my name backwards in it, <laughs> with the high score. I have the whole magazine. It was just given to me recently. And I said, I've been telling people that story for ages. This proves it. It's really, it really was in there. I might even have the, that Nintendo Power in storage somewhere where I keep all my old stuff. Why do I stick with the Game Boy? You know, I got so good at it, and I love playing it. And when I try it on a computer, it's different keys. I'd have to relearn it a bit. So I just... Um, don't ask me. It's just what you get used to. Sure, sure. You know why do I why do I keep using an iPhone or something? So I'll play it again. I'll start the game and I'll I'll plop it up to level nine to start with. That's wow. the highest. Oh. There's a tricky way. I learned a few tricks. You can hold some keys down, and when it says nine, it's actually nineteen. It just freaks people out. They can't understand why it seems too fast so to this play. Is your favorite game of all time, would you say? Um, no, I'd say it's one that I've played the most. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, when I go to concerts. Very often, for, for 20 some years, I'd sit next to my friend Robert. He and I would have a link cable between us, and we would play Tetris the entire concert because our ears can hear the music. If something really astounding comes on, we would stop and stand up. You know, we'd listen to the music too. We gave it full attention. Mm -hmm. But we've, you know, we so much into music after 20 years of seeing every concert, you've seen every group and you know their stuff. So I will start the game and. And I don't know, it's hard to uh, describe exactly what I'm doing in words. I know, my head knows what I'm doing. And it's, 
Have you ever met the creator of Tetris? Have you ever tried yes, I um, have. I haven't tried talking to him. The creator, of course, I read the story, mm -hmm. um, and I was just astounded by the story in an Atari magazine mm -hmm. of how they how Nintendo licensed from this Russian developer. Yeah. And when and I did a lot of Russian U.S. Um, peace efforts, so I would be invited to to shows where Gorbachev was at, for example. Right next to Gorbachev would be sitting the developer of Tetris, and I gave Gorbachev once when he was sitting next to the guy, I gave him a, a, a Game Boy wrapped in red, a U.S. Game Boy with Tetris. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, so I but I was I was too shy to ever talk directly to the programmer, <laughs> but um, you know it's just so incredible to look onto a simple game that's so new that just grabs people forever. How many? Um, you know, classic games that are going to be with us forever came about in our life. Not very many. Not very many at the power of Tetris and um, you could think of a few other. Sudoku, you know, fits into that category. Just major games forever. Sure. And here comes my first Tetris. Beep. I should turn on the sound, huh? Yeah. I think that's necessary. What's on the skin of that game? Let me think. Oh, um, in Japan, in Japan, they sold a clear one called Astro Boy. Mm -hmm. It's just what they called it. I didn't yeah. put anything on it. Okay. Right. They also sold a beautiful red one, the most beautiful one of all. And um, I have one of those at home that I just recently bought on eBay. <laughs> sure, sure. Have you tried any other games for the Game Boy? Other than Tetris? Um, yes, I tried quite a few when it was brand new, mm -hmm. and very easy to play. But I just like Tetris. Uh, I'm kind of, it kind of fits a mathematical mind too. Now I've got a big, a big deep hole in here that I'm going to be thinking about, thinking about, thinking about, and starting to ditch out of it already. Got to, I always clear things quicker rather than waiting till later. And I can get into quite a bit of trouble that people think there's no way you can get out of that. And, and um, I pride myself on, on being able to recover very well. Now, I've met people that can play better than I do. Young kids in high school, for example. But um, in my time frame, when they kept track in Nintendo Power Magazine, I always had the high score, and I'm very proud of that. That keeps me. That, that's another thing that keeps me playing. I think. <laughs> although, Sorry, although sometimes I I, ru I start running out of time, and okay, I, then I give it up for a while. You always play with the sound on. You like the music quite a bit. Um, I almost never play with the sound on, but I do like the music. <laughs> yeah, I like I like the fact that it's. You can also kind of almost joke about it too, mm -hmm. when people say the. That Russian marching tune that's in Tetris, you know, it, it leads to a lot of good jokes. I'm in very serious trouble at the moment. I'm going to find out if I can escape this one. Tetris the, piece helps, huh? You gave a copy of the game to George Bush, too, George Alaska? Yes. Um, I gave him one wrapped red, white, and blue at a special meeting I had with him. And, um, and about a week later, he was in the hospital um, with a heart, some kind of heart ailment. Mm -hmm. And they showed him on our Channel 11 News in San Francisco, and they showed him in one magazine that I saw him playing the Game Boy in his hospital bed. And so it had to be mine. <laughs> I mean, unless he had, well, it's possible a kid of his gave him one too. Mm -hmm. So it didn't have to be mine. So you just carry around copies of Tetris and Game Boys just to give out for... No, 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 no. I just thought of it two times in my life. <laughs> once for Gorbachev and once for Bush. But, you know, for Gorbachev, it made a lot of sense because it was a Russian game. When I, when I brought it to him, I had no idea he was going to actually be sitting next to the developer. And the reason he was sitting next to the developer was Russia was starting to realize that resources, oil, wasn't going to be their economic, you know, lifeblood forever. And they better um, look into finding, you know, some way to get into the information technology age. And this was their one real success of marketing to the a consumer product to the West. Yeah. I think you played a lot of Mario back in the day on the NES. Those I sure did. I sure did. And that was the one really where I, I was... Teach my kid, I had so much fun. I bought them for the house. I loved that game. I loved playing. And then when my son got better than me, I got near to finishing it too. Yeah, he got better than me. And, you know, well, maybe I'm due for other games now. Yes, but my sons tended to move into the more normal games that you'd be much more familiar with. Um, and they, um, so they got to the games and they just got the, the two player or, you know, one person shooter or whatever those games are called. Um, we had one on the Macintosh. We didn't have very many, and it was called Marathon, I think. Mm -hmm. And I loved playing it. Oh, my God. I would sit in there playing it with my classes of kids, but they were all better than me. So I was really weak, but I wanted to get on a good team. To get on a good team with a good shooter, you can still do okay. Well, I had this one, this one older kid. Like, the kids in my class were fifth graders, and I had this sixth grader guy that was the game expert of them all, Kenny. And he was at my house. 
I had my houses linked on the same network as my office where I had my classroom. And so I, I told all the kids, well, my son Gary, who's only in fourth grade, younger, he's going to play. Kenny logged in as Gary. They couldn't see him. They didn't know it was the super game player. And Gary was just wiping them away, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and then it's really funny because later on, Gary came into a class one day and we broke to play marathon. And, and they were saying, how come you're not doing so well this time, Gary? And he was saying, uh, he has to have the right, right um, joystick or something. <laughs> yes, and I play it on airplanes. I, I fly so much, you kind of need something to break the time a little bit, you know, and just just to pass the time while you're on the plane. So I, I do two things, I, three things. I bring a Game Boy, I bring my music on an iPod Nano, and I hook up my um, earphones to it, yeah. and I pl get pencil games. Um, it's like Sudoku, it's a number game called Cross Sums. You know how crosswords have words that intersect? Well, I'm mathematical. I prefer these ones where numbers intersect. You have to make the numbers out of a bunch of different digits that add up to totals. It's a very, very cool game for a mathematician. Mm -hmm. So I carry those on airplanes because when you're taking off and landing, you're not allowed to use have electronics on. You know they have Tetris on the iPhone. Are you ever interested in checking out that version? Or um, like game I, I'm not because basically my experiences are that, mm, you know, I, I don't like being very, very good at one, one format and then I really can't carry over to the others. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, it's... it's Kind of shallow to say it, but it's, that's how it is. There's a lot of good games with numbers that I would probably enjoy, but I have so little time now that I tend to stick with the one. <laughs> Great, I think we're just about running out of time. Yeah. Okay, I'm still live at least, but... No, I love it. I don't okay. Take over your whole day. Alrighty. <laughs> you said uh, Tetris was... Well, it only takes about favorite. 10 minutes a game. Did you have... No, it's, 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 I wouldn't say it's my favorite. Right. I would say in my whole life, um, I have played Tetris so much it might be called my favorite, but I would say probably my playing Bridge was my favorite, and Pinochle and Hearts also. Okay. Uh, oh, Magic the Gathering. Oh my God, I love. That's your favorite game of all. I love that game. I bought. I I actually have in my in my garage Alpha sets, complete sets really? that were sold to collectors only. Yeah, so rare, unopened, still sealed. Really? Yeah, they. Um, yeah, my son, my son and I would play that, and it was very successful because um, if if we had to learn some some difficult subject in school that he was having trouble with, maybe we have to start with the book, go from from page one to page zero, do every single problem in the book, write the programs that his class didn't even have to do to learn it really well. Mm -hmm. Study. We both study together. We'd read the chapters together, work on the work, and then take a break uh, halfway through the chapter, do a little test on ourselves see how our answers compared, then we'd play Magic the Gathering. And then we'd go back and do more of the chapter. We did this over Christmas vacation for two weeks straight. He wound up, you know, basically getting back into math where he was going to kind of fail, and he wound up getting the math awards in both his middle school and his high school.